risk related to mining and mineral processing, including exploration, development, smelting, refining, safety, environmental protection, product stewardship, recycling, and research. Because of a combined focus and passion for tech and its values, the company's leadership team is committed to delivering shareholder value. Don Lindsay is today's focus interview on CKNW's Chief Executives. Good morning. Good morning. You sound like uh, you have a very busy life. Well, there are a few things to do each day, and uh, we just try and get through it all. I find that, you know, it's interesting. When anybody asks me what I do for a living, I, I usually answer, I just do what I'm told, because everyone's always telling me something to do, and I just try and get as much of it done as I can. <laughs> but in the end, you're the, the buck stops here, as they, as they say. You're the, you, you are the chief executive officer. You make the final call. That is true. Uh, I'm accountable for all of the bad decisions, and uh, the good decisions were generally made by someone else. Uh, how did you get started? Do you remember your first job? Yeah, it depends uh, what you think of as your first job. My first job, I guess, was really as a, a, a Globe and Mail delivery boy. And, you know, that money bought my first bicycle, or not my first bicycle, bicycle the bicycle that I wanted. And that was uh, pretty important at that time. But, uh, you know, beyond that, uh, there were the summer jobs in high school, groundskeeper. I worked in a factory that made uh, uh, cure ads. Do you know what cure ads are? No. They're Band-Aids. And I, okay, yeah, sure. I'll never I forget, that I was on the tour of the factory, and I saw this machine that was stamping out what I thought were Band-Aids, and I said, oh, you make Band-Aids. And they said, no, we make cure ads. You'll go on night shift. <laughs> that, that, that was sort of my start. But uh, then I, I worked underground in Uranium City uh, uh, in Saskatchewan, northern Saskatchewan, and then my first permanent job was uh, in Labrador City. And what out. was that? I was a foreman in the, in the pit. Uh, I remember I... Uh, I arrived in Labrador City, uh, northern Canada, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and by midnight on night shift, I was a foreman in charge of 25 guys in the Steelworkers Union in a, in a mine that I, it was dark. I had no idea where I was. It was, uh, you know, it was a pretty interesting experience. The, fir- the first shift, I, I went on this, this beaten up old school bus with the 25 guys, and, uh, you know, I'm a young kid, 21 years old, and I got my clipboard, and I give them the assignments, and uh, a guy in the back of the bus says, hey, kid. Have you ever heard any Newfie jokes? And you know you're being set up, right? So I said, yeah, I heard a few. Why? He says, well, we got one for you. I said, yeah, what's that? He said, why are Newfie jokes so bad? I said, I don't know why. He says, because Torontonians made them up. (laughs) And this was the first shot across the bow because I had come from Toronto at that stage. And uh, they weren't that keen on people from Toronto coming in to be their boss and that sort of thing. And what what they generally try to do in the first three or four months is run you out of town. But if you lasted till Christmas... Then the Newfoundlanders, they're, they're so gracious. They, they would adopt you as family for life. I got a lot of good friends there. It was a wonderful time. And some pretty good life lessons. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, you, you need to learn to adapt to a whole different culture. When I first arrived there, the, you know, the accent's pretty thick. I couldn't understand a lot of what people were saying. In fact, the first uh, three or four weeks uh, as a foreman, I paid my uh, uh, laborer to, to sit beside me in the truck to translate what my boss was saying to me because... Uh, uh, he was a terrific guy, but he, you know, didn't have a lot of education. He worked his way up, and uh, uh, very, very thick accent. I wasn't sure what he was saying. Well, in a, in a sense, you did the same thing. I mean, you started uh, on the ground and and worked your way worked your way up. Yeah, it sort of sort of went that way. Uh, it was a classic cyclical business. You know, uh, when I first got there, the industry was booming, but by eighty two, eighty three, it was. Uh, in a pretty deep recession at that time. In fact, in the steel industry, you'd almost call it a depression. And uh, we had to lay off a lot of people. I was on one of uh, uh, Brian Mulroney's uh, special task force. He was actually president of IOC before he became prime minister. And everything I did for six months meant that people were going to lose their jobs. And uh, I could see my own number on the wall, too, so I went back to school after that. How tough is that? How tough is it to have to actually tell somebody they're, they're fired? Or laid off. Well, it's tough. It's one of the worst things uh, you have to do as part of any job. But uh, I think people could see, uh, you know, what was happening in the world. And, and uh, uh, a lot of it's fairly automatic when, it, when you're dealing with unionized workers. There's seniority that comes into play, and, and they kind of know where, where they are on the list. But uh, uh, when you're thinning out the management ranks, that's, that's a pretty tough thing to do. Did you have mentors along the way? Yeah, I, I, I would say there are two key people, uh, you know, currently my own chairman, Dr. Norman Keevil, would, would be my mentor, and uh, he has extraordinary experience and perspective, and 
and you know we we see each if he if he's in town we see each other every day that he's in town uh, for a few minutes and, and talk frequently when he's not so he's provided a lot of guidance and wisdom uh, before that when i was at cibc uh, john hunkin was a key mentor of mine and he ultimately became chairman and ceo of the bank and uh uh, he always took a, a real interest in people, you know, and and uh, you listen closely to his advice. Can you define what you learned from them? You know, I think uh, uh, there, there would be a number of lessons uh, uh, from John. I think one of the most important lessons would be to, to surround yourself with good people. You know, uh, they, they talk about... Uh, you know, first-rate people hire first-rate people. Second-rate people hire third-rate people, so they aren't challenged or threatened. I think hiring people who are who are, who are better than you at what you need doing is is uh, really important, and and making sure that everybody understands that the team comes first. You know, this is this is crucial. Uh, how do you handle your time management? Uh, do you have some tricks to to scheduling? I have the most fantastic executive assistant you can imagine. I do whatever she says. That's that's the main trick, but uh, you know um, you have to prioritize. Uh, there's always uh, more to do than you can do. You have to delegate the the right things to the right people. Uh, and are you a good uh, delegator? Uh, reasonable. There's some things you got, got to stay on top of yourself, but uh, you know if you really think through it, uh, most things uh, there's someone in your organization that could do it better than you, and uh, and. It's important to keep that in mind. So is that what being a leader is all about, to, to, to picking the right people to, to, to help you through? That I think that is the most crucial part of the job, is getting the right people in the right places and making sure they have the right direction, that they know where you're heading and uh, that you're all pulling together, you're on the same team. I don't know that, if there the are, are, are any comparisons with politics, but I was just thinking that, I mean, a lot of people said about Ronald Reagan was that he kind of acted like a CEO. He hired uh, good people or appointed good people, people that he, he put a lot of trust in, and he kind of let them do their jobs. That is key, letting them do their job, because if you're micromanaging, then uh, eventually they'll lose the self-starter, self-motivation uh, aspect. I mean, you're talking with senior, experienced, capable people. Uh, if you've got that kind of a person, uh, you better not get in the way. You better let them do their job. Talking with Don Lindsay, President and CEO of Tech Resources Limited. We'll continue our conversation after this short break. Talking with uh, Don Lindsay, President and CEO of Tech Resources uh, Limited. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you do a lot of traveling. Yes. To some interesting places, I guess. Uh, you know, we, we travel to China several times a year to uh, stay in touch with that uh, economy, which is so important to our industry, to Japan or, or uh, uh, to the sites. I was in Chile last week for a week, and uh, of course uh, up to Alaska, Toronto, Montreal, New York, Boston is the circuit for shareholders, and London for shareholders as well. So You passed by Chile rather quickly. You were, you were there during the earthquake. Yeah, no, I was there. I was on uh, the 17th floor of a hotel and uh, you know despite all the training that we get in earth you know we train our our workforce uh, our kids get lots of education about earthquakes at school I've got an earthquake kit in the garage and the rest of it when it actually happens it's amazing how sometimes you forget the lessons and do the wrong thing so what did you do I was actually at the time on the phone leaving a voicemail for my daughter my 12 year old and uh, you know the earthquake started and I was just about to sort of say good night and then I started to describe to her what was happening. And the TV was sliding across the table, about to crash on the floor. And I'm hanging onto the phone and trying to stop the TV from falling. What you're supposed to do is get under your desk right away in case anything's going to be falling from the ceiling. And, of course, I didn't do that. How long did it last? last? It was 65 seconds, I think. And it was the, the biggest one that they've had since the big one that would cause so much tragedy. Uh, and the, uh, I'm told that, and that was about a two minute one, but the, the 65 seconds that we had were identical to the first 65 seconds of the big one, but then it just stopped. And, you know, I looked out the window to see, uh, are people evacuating the building and only about, uh, three people left the building. Two of them were tech people actually, but <laughs> really, because they did the right thing. And then I, I, the TV was still working. So I turned it on. Of course, every single channel was nothing but the government representatives on the earthquake and the rest of it. But, uh. I'd been in several tremors before in Japan and San Francisco and other places, but never in an actual earthquake. Talk a little bit about Chile, because I've uh, talked to a number of people this year who've come back from trips to Chile, uh, some pleasure, some business, uh, and they all uh, are, are quite wide-eyed about the place. 
Yeah, we we uh, are very positive on Chile. We have about four thousand employees there now. Two uh, two operations running, and then two large development projects. Uh, we uh, just announced last week the results of a final feasibility study for what we call the QB2 project, Corbata Blanca. And um, uh, if we decide to go ahead, that's a $5.6 billion project. It would create about 9,000 jobs when it's being built and 2,000 permit jobs. 9,000? So, yeah, so it's a, it's a big project for that country. So we had you know meetings with uh, the key ministers in their government, you know, getting a good feel for the investment climate, because these things are so important. Wherever you go, whether it's uh, in Chile, we, we, we watch Australia, we watch uh, what happens in the U.S., we can watch what happens here in B.C., that... Uh, you know, the stability in the rules is so important because for the kind of investments we make, they're, they're investments for 30 or 40 years, and you're putting big capital in for four, five, six years up front, and then it takes several years to get get the money back. So you're exposed for at least 10 or 12 years. You don't want to, you know, see countries that change the rules on you all the time. So stability is really important, and Chile has that. So you're comfortable with Chile. Yeah. Uh, what about China? China, of course, is the most important market for our products. Uh, here's how the world's changed in the last 10 years, Bill. 10 years ago in copper, which, of course, BC produced a lot of copper, the United States accounted for, these are rough numbers, but say 25% of global consumption of copper, and China was maybe 6 or 7%. Today, 10 years later, China accounts for 40%, and the U.S. is down to about 7%. It's just completely turned over. Wow. In fact, in China, in steel, which is an important... Uh, 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 product that we we supply steel making coal from BC to to plants there. China is now eight times the size of the United States and growing and growing, yeah, continuing to grow. Do we have the capacity to meet their market demand? Well, we're expanding our capacity. We've been investing heavily in British Columbia, creating uh, a lot of jobs. We hired. Uh, uh, 1,000 people in 2011, 1,500 in 2010 in BC, uh, all related to the expansion programs we have in uh, in the Elk Valley to try and meet that demand, and uh, it's going well. I talked about uh, that, uh, not specifically to tech, but to, to the resource industry with Adrian Dix this morning, and he talked about the the absolute need for job training to train people, and 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 he made the point not just university training. That's right. But skills training. Skills training is so crucial. Yeah, you know we we continue to uh, have a need. One of the things that happened in the mining industry is uh, you know there are twenty pretty tough years there, and so not that many people went to it. So we have a a demographic bulge in the. Uh, sort of 48 to 58 uh, uh, age bracket. So we will have a lot of people retiring in the next five years and trying to replace those skills is going to be very difficult. And, uh, you know, the, the trades in particular, there's a real shortage of trades. So what, what kind of trades, what kind of training do people need to get if they're looking down the road and saying uh, in five years there's going to there's going to be a lot of job opportunities. Yeah, I mean we're talking the basics, heavy duty mechanics, electricians, these kind of things that this is uh, this is going to be really important. There'll be a lot of work, high paying jobs. They're well paid jobs. They are well paid jobs, yeah. But not many of them are in Vancouver, are they? Not in downtown Vancouver, but I'll tell you if you go to uh, to uh, Trail uh, where we have our, our large smelting and refining facility, the people who live there, wherever we try and transfer them, they never want to leave because they love living in Trail because it's a fantastic community. If you go to uh, Highland Valley Copper, uh, Logan Lake, or Kamloops, uh, I mean, we can never transfer anybody out of Kamloops. They love living there. So uh, you go to Fernie, Sparwood, you know, these, these are communities that people love to live in. So pretty nice lifestyle.